The Heart of Art is sponsored in part by the Texas A&M University Art Galleries, which includes the Stark and Forsyth Galleries located inside the MSC. The galleries provide a variety of opportunities to experience art exhibitions, events, and hands-on activities. More information at uart.tamu.edu. The Heart of Art is brought to you by the Academy for the Visual and Performing Arts at Texas A&M University, bringing innovative and culturally diverse visual and performing arts programming to Texas A&M University and the Brazos Valley. The Academy for the Visual and Performing Arts fosters the creativity of our community via the transformative power of the arts. The Heart of Art, scoping the Brussels Valley for the best artists and bringing them to your radio. Howdy, good afternoon everyone. Welcome back to the KME Studios. My name is Hector Nino and you're listening to The Heart of Art. Today we have a very special show planned for you. We actually have two guests coming in uh, for this show. We have Carissa Armstrong, who is an associate professor uh, under the Department of Dance Science, as well as Christine Bergeron, who is the Dean of Academic Affairs at the School of Performance Visualization and Fine Arts, as well as a clinical professor for dance science. And they work together to choreograph the award-winning uh, show, But Where There Is Hope, There Is Life. And this is a choreography that was a collaboration with the Academy of Visual and Performing Arts, uh, which focused on the Holocaust and the dangers that hate causes. Carissa and Christina are also artistic directors at the Brazos Dance Collective. And we have a great conversation of this choreography, um, of where this where their idea started, um, how the audience is involved in the choreography, and how they even got through COVID times with still being able to provide the audience with uh, a great experience. So make sure to stay tuned for that. All right, now for our announcements, we have the MSC VAC, which stands for Visual Arts Committee, is a student organization here at A&M. And they're hosting their yearly student competition called ArtFest 2023. And this, and this is a, a competition in, in which candidates submitted their works and now will be on exhibit until April 29th, after which the winners will be chosen. So if you want to come see the talent of the students here at a and make sure to go to the MSC at the James R. Reynolds Gallery to look at all these submissions for the ArtFest 2023. All right, and now for tomorrow, March 5th, uh, the Brazos Valley Chorale will be hosting Night Light, a choral concert featuring Mozart's Solemn Vespers and Dan Forrest's Lux the Dawn from on High. This will take place at the First Presbyterian Church in Bryan, and this place has a great sound, and it will be accompanied by a nine-piece chamber orchestra, and some of these are actually from the Brazos Valley Orchestra, so uh, I encourage you to all to go check this out, if you'd like to purchase tickets, you can visit bvcorral.org. That's bvcorral.org. All right, let's start my conversation with Carissa Armstrong and Christine Bergeron. We have two guests in the studio. This is actually a first for The Heart of Art. And they are Carissa Armstrong and Christine Bergeron. Uh, Carissa is an associate professor at the School of Performance, Visualization, and Fine Arts, while Christine is the Dean of Academic Affairs and a clinical professor at the School of Performance, Visualization, and Fine Arts. They are also both artistic directors of uh, the Brazos Dance Collective and have choreographed the award-winning But Where There Is Hope, There Is Life. So hi, Chris and Christine. How are you both today? Great. How are you? Good. Doing great. Um, well, before we go into your choreography, uh, I would like to go into your background. And I was wondering, uh, Carissa, has dancing always been a part of your life? and um, Or did you take classes as a child? Well, um, I took classes whenever I was a teeny tiny and had tap shoes and annoyed my parents and, you know, made lots of noise around the house. Um, but I didn't stay with it my entire life. I actually didn't start dancing seriously until 
I got into high school. Um, I was on the dance team and then um, really started like my technical study in college um, with the hopes of being able to teach dance. And my original thought was that that was going to be at high school. And then um, kind of looked at my college professors and went like, hey, that's that seems like a really good gig. I think that's what I actually <laughs> want to do. I want to teach college. So I went and got my graduate um degree in Cleveland, Ohio, which is kind of, um, this weather is reminding me of that <laughs> lovely, right. icy, cold business. Yes, it's been chilly. <laughs> yes, and then got back to Texas, you know, as soon as I could. Okay, great. And uh, for you, Christine, were, were you one of those children in, in a dance class? I actually didn't start to middle school. My sister dragged me to dance because she wanted to go and didn't want to go alone. But oh, my sister's really? five years older than me, so it was like <laughs> she it was like a jazz class, I think, and she was way older than I was. And I stuck with it, and she bailed out after like hmm. about two months. So, <laughs> um, and then I just never really left, and I danced in a studio that kind of did it all. So I did the jazz, tap, ballet, musical theater, the whole nine yards. And then I went to school um, as an undergrad. And then I taught in a high school, performing arts high school for three years, and then went back to grad school, moved to Texas and danced with a company in Austin and found my way to Texas A&M about 22 years ago, 23 actually now, I think this month. Oh, wow. And here I am. So. <laughs> well, thank you for stopping by Texas A&M. We really appreciate your presence here and your expertise. Um, how did you two meet? Because I know that you guys are, are very good friends and you have both choreographed this together. So um, you've probably spent countless hours together. <laughs> yep, many years. I came in uh, January of 2000 and Carissa joined faculty in fall of 2003. And... We both wanted to continue our own dancing as professionals. And so we started a company pretty much right away <laughs> um, because we both were like, oh, College Station doesn't have a modern dance. Oh, we're modern dancers. Oh, let's just create that. So <laughs> we just started doing duets and, and uh, starting the, um, performing across the state in different festivals. And then that just kind of grew to a company that was the Armstrong Bergeron Dance Company that evolved over time into the Brazos Dance Collective. Okay, so you saw a need and, and you fulfilled it. Yes, yes. <laughs> totally. All right, and where did um, the idea of this choreography of But Where There Is Hope, There Is Life come from? Was it before you created this uh, dance collective? Well, I think that this has been on Christine's bucket list um, for choreography for a very long time. Um, and she and I, for the past 20 years, have created a lot of work together and um, separately some, but we really enjoy the collaboration process between the two of us. Um, and we have kind of a, a rhythm set up where you know, if she's working with some dancers and I see a possibility, I jump in. And if um, I'm working with some dancers and she sees something that could work, then she jumps in. So it really made sense for us to kind of tackle this monster of a project um, together. And I'll let her kind of talk about her original thoughts behind why this subject matter. Yes, please. Um, I've always been drawn to this part of our history for some reason. I, I don't really know why, but I've always read books um, about the Holocaust and people's um, mainly survivor stories, and I'm just always drawn to it. And I, I can't really explain why. It's just something that I just have always even in high school, it would when I learned about it, it was just something that I just kept doing, and I just kept picking it up and um, picking up a book and reading, and um, and so I really felt like I had all these ideas. I actually remember being in an airport <laughs> and just basically mapping it all out, um, and I had it for about in my head for about fifteen years before we actually broached, okay, it's time to do that. And so wow. when things started shifting in our country towards hate, um, I felt like 
as an artist, I can't keep quiet anymore and I need to remind people where hate leads us. Mm -hmm. And so as scary as a project of this magnitude is, um, I said, okay, how do we do it? Um, and so we started our conversations about actually doing the thing that was in my head <laughs> um, and, and putting it out onto a stage in, in different ways. Yeah, there were a couple of years um, that kind of led up to this. Um, my husband and I started, uh, he became really interested in international travel and our first place that we went was Krakow, Poland. And so we planned a trip to go out to Auschwitz, Birkenau and toured those camps and got to hear some of the things that I think are left out of the American public school education when it comes to the Holocaust and how all of it developed and the level of inhumanity that was forced upon such a huge number of people. Um, and I think for us also, it always comes back to the humanity. You know, um, one of my dance professors years ago, we had an aesthetics class that talked about art and the impact of art. And I always just remember her saying that, you know, the best art is universal. It speaks to everyone, regardless of your background or your situation, um, any kind of knowledge that you happen to have. And I feel like Chris and I have always tried to approach our art from that perspective, that even though this work is really connected to that particular event, that it was important for us to be addressing the current issue and climate that was happening in our country and still is on many levels. So we feel like it crosses lots of boundaries um, and tries to get at the root of the human element. Right, yeah. I feel like um, the main point is that hate that is in this world and that's what we're trying to battle here and thank you so much for working on that by the way you know one of the things that drew me towards this choreography was also um, the different disciplines used within it because I feel like it's not just dance it was a whole collaborative effort so uh, I was wondering if you guys could talk a little bit about that about what different disciplines are, were being used sure I think one of the um, things that we knew we needed to do when we were putting this work together was that it couldn't just be Carissa and I, that we needed more voices in the process. Um, neither Carissa or I are Jewish, so we also felt like we needed to make sure that we were honoring and respecting um, the Jewish history, and this is obviously a huge part of their history. So we wanted to make sure that we were bringing in Consultant. So we have some consultants on our committee that have either um, that are either Jewish themselves and had families impacted, um, or um, there is a um, professor um, from Purdue that focuses in on homosexuals in the Holocaust. And then we have Adam Sheep here that is part of the history department, and that is his area of focus. And then we also included the director of the Hillel. So we also know that we needed to include all aspects kind of um, on this project, but we also have visualization as part of it because we knew that we wanted um, some abstract vi uh, visualization aspects of it where it was um, like for the first piece called The Rise, which is Hitler's speech. Mm -hmm. There's some um, abstract propaganda photos and things that are um, drawing through it um, as the dancers dancing. Um, but we also included um, Jim Ball from Performance Studies and Ann Crockenbush, which is an actor in Performance Studies, and they worked with a group of students to create text that is also incorporated um, into the audience's um, experience because the work does not was not designed for people to just sit in seats and watch it on a stage, but the audience actually moves from ver to various locations. Oh, really? And so they're listening to these actors um, that that text was built off of historical um, monologues and things of people's um, experiences 
all the way through the Holocaust. So um, even just when people were starting to be um, gathered up and all of a sudden people were disappearing. So there's some monologues that address that as well as monologues of uh, soldiers that went into the camps to liberate and what they experienced and what they saw. So um, Adam gave Jim basically this here's this here's all these texts that you could use and then they created um a mo short monologues that kind of happen along the way f as people are traveling from one location to the next wow okay so how exactly does that work how do you or is there a conventional theater used or where does it take place well, our original concept was that um, Christine and I have been connected to downtown Bryan um, since we first moved here. Um, there was an art collective that was kind of starting at the same time that she and I were starting our company. And though they were really focused on visual art, we were really hoping that we would be able to bring dance to our community. So when we started envisioning this project, um, we started thinking about that the audience would travel from location to location in downtown Bryan, and they would have a tour guide. And this is to replicate this concept of uh, the transient nature that was happening for um, peoples being displaced and that they didn't know where they were going to go and um, this concept of just having to trust that um, the next step was going to be the right step. Um, so when we started looking at that, we started mapping it out um, and we actually did our dress rehearsal in downtown Bryan and um, the next week, the entire world shut down because of COVID. Oh, no. So yeah. um, many of our dancers were seniors at Texas A&M at that point. Um, so they graduated, not getting to actually ever perform this work. Oh. When we got back um, on campus, um, we decided that we really needed to get some high-quality film of all of these pieces because we did not know what was going to happen. Everything was kind of unsure. Right. And so because Rudder Theater Complex was shut down because of COVID, we were able to go into the auditorium and we were in there for two or three days, three days, I think, filming all day. Um, and we had, you know, a crew of uh, camera operators and director and, you know, videographer and yeah. um, all of our dancers and everybody was masked um, still at that point. So we, we wound up with these really beautiful films. Um, and so when things started opening up a little bit more, we went back to, okay, how are we going to do this? Because um, it's not going to look the same as what we really wanted it to be, which was going to be highly interactive with audience members carrying suitcases and um, all kinds of different things, elements, theater, theatrical elements that were going to be incorporated into it. And um, so we're really hoping that we'll get back to producing that real world aspect of it. Mm -hmm. But the aspect that we actually did get to produce in downtown Bryan um, was we used some of the film in some of the places with the larger works. And then we have solos, duets, that were presented um, through the film. So the audience still traveled. There was still some interactive theatrical elements, um, but we weren't really able to produce it in the its greatest vision. Um, we also did do a proscenium staged version at Rudder Theater, which was streamed as well as produced live. Um, and we have several performances coming up. We have we're going to Carrollton ISD at the end of February and producing this work in two high schools. And so it will travel through the high school. All the dancing pretty much will be live. I think we have a couple of dances that are on film based on space issues. Um, and their high school dancers will be per performing one of the works. Um, we've also been accepted to Asheville Fringe Festival that will happen at the end of March. And so we're in the process of planning what that performance will look like. So it kind of worked out that we wound up with these gorgeous films. Um, and it allows us to maybe give audience members 
an experience, um, maybe not in the exact artistic way that we had envisioned, but I think it gives greater access to the work. I think the films were a blessing in disguise in some ways because it's actually made the work much more versatile in the venues that we're in. So we have performed it at Allen Academy here in town as well. And we were able to do parts of it live, parts of it in film. Um, We've also been able to, during COVID, a lot of festivals that happened over Zoom or um, a lot more film type festivals came up because that was the only way performers could exist. Um, And having these works allowed us to be able to participate in all of those versus bringing 17 dancers to a location that has a huge cost to it we were able to just here's a link to the (laughs) to the film so it actually has enabled us to get the work the work out in a broader way Mm -hmm. so even though personally I wasn't happy at the time that we were putting everything on film because something that I had envisioned for so long had to be altered by COVID and there was definitely a sense of sadness um there um i think in the end it's allowed us to to make the work a lot more adaptable going into the high schools oh you don't have a huge place where we can put these 17 dancers to perform this very aggressive large work oh we'll just film it because we have that now or and so i think it's enabled us to actually do a lot more with it than we would have been able to do if every aspect of it had to be live Right. Yeah. I think it's a great example of how resilient humans are. I mean, through every obstacle, you guys were able to surpass it and to even get your message out there despite all these difficulties. So I congratulate you guys for for doing that because I bet that was very, very difficult. (laughs) Yes. Thank you. Um, Yeah. As I'm as I'm sitting here listening to all of this, I'm like, how appropriate, though, a work that is about human resilience. And Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that eventually we will present it in the way that we wanted it presented but um i think all of those obstacles speak to exactly why we created this work is that the the human spirit will overcome and persevere right all right you guys we will be going on a quick break but do not go anywhere we will be right back Support for KAMU comes from the Academy for the Visual and Performing Arts at Texas A&M University, bringing innovative and culturally diverse visual and performing arts programming to Texas A&M University and the Brazos Valley. The Academy for the Visual and Performing Arts fosters the creativity of our community via the transformative power of the arts. All right, you guys, welcome back to the show. Now we will continue my conversation with Carissa Armstrong and Christine Bergeron. I did want to go over a little bit. I know you mentioned that the beginning of the choreography is about Hitler's speech. Mm -hmm. What other aspects of um, the Holocaust do you cover? So there's nine sections right now. Okay. Um, It starts with Hitler's speech. It is a, a famous speech of his, but we have warped it because I just can't handle hearing Hitler speak. Mm -hmm. So we we were able to alter it, and so it sounds like this warped um, sound, um, which I think is kind of appropriate. Um, And so it starts with uh, his speech, and then it moves on to um, a table piece. We call it the table, but it's not really called that. Um, And it's four people around a table and how... a conversation that you're having in a very like, oh, I'm with my family and we talk about the day and it, we make jokes and all of that, how that innocent type of thing can change. So it starts out very um, innocent in that way. And then all of a sudden people start hearing noises at the door and, and, and all of a sudden dinner becomes something else. It becomes a place of sorrow and, and, um, so and then it moves into a duet about two sisters that have to make a choice about staying together um, or are they safer apart and so those decisions as families had to be made about should we stay together or do do i need to send my 
children into this safe space so that um, they have a better chance because I know that all, you know, people can't take the whole family in and hide the whole family. So if we broke up, maybe we could find places to hide um, separately. So, um, and then it moves into what we call our, our bed solo. And it is about several, Chris and I went to several survivor stories and the professor that I told you about earlier that um, focuses in on um, homosexuals in the Holocaust, his aunt lived in a closet for two years during the Holocaust. And one of the survivors' stories that Carissa and I went to in Washington, it was um, they also talked about him and his sibling living in an old armoire um, for two, uh, 18 months. So... The bed solo is about being in a very confined space and how if you're in it that long, you know every single inch of it, but it's your safety, but it's also at any time anyone could open the door. So it's about being surrounded by sounds that you don't really know exactly who those sounds are being made from and in the fear of that um, and just having to live in a small enclosed space for an extended period of time. Then it moves to a film, actually, um, that will always be a film because of where it was uh, uh, filmed, Um, and it's called The Ghettos, and so it's about people living in the ghettos, and then it moves into Transport, which is about gathering up people, putting them on a train, um, and that train leading them to a concentration camp, so the next section is about a concentration camp, and them walking into the concentration camp, the fear that was there has representation of roll call and them having to stand for extended period of time, um, being shifted a job from one, you know, you're taking rocks from one side of the camp to the other side of the camp. And so it has that um, type of energy as well. And then it moves into a sand solo, which is about um, the sense of loss and the amount of loss and just about loss in general Um, and then it moves into liberation and how uh, soldiers come into the camp and liberate the camp and and the joy in that but also the exhaustion in that Um, because one thing I don't think that we ever really talk about in the Holocaust is the aftermath of the Holocaust and that these people were still displaced and didn't have families and didn't have anything and they were their bodies were so malnutritioned that even just eating sometimes made people sick and so there's all this other part that we don't really talk about and that is the 10th section that hasn't been choreographed yet um, that I feel like you know we really still also need to talk about because I know when we in K-12 through education my daughter has in high school had two slides on the Holocaust so there's definitely not enough information being given to our student our students about um, this important part of our history and it isn't just the Jewish history it is humanity's history Um, we were all involved in the um, liberation of this horrific event and we all played a part in it and so I and we're all responsible for it in some way and so um, I think it's important for us to look at all aspects of that in our history and not just learn about what it is, but do we teach our children about what the U.S.'s role was in the Holocaust? Mm -hmm. Um, I love that it's still growing, too, because you just said that there might be a tenth part? (laughs) Yes. It's still growing. It's like there's so many aspects of this project. It's like, where do we end? Where do we end? Yeah, has it ended? Will it ever end? Yes. One thing that I wanted to make sure that we represented is that there were 11 million people killed in the Holocaust, and not all of them were Jewish, that there were other um, groups that were persecuted. And so um, our dancers wear these circles of various colors, and the circles represent all of the different um, people that were put in camps. Um, but I, I do recognize that there was a variety of people that were um, persecuted in the Holocaust. Um, and we need to remember them all. Thank you guys for choreographing something that highlights this. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm Hector Nino, and you've been listening to The Heart of Art, a production of 90.9 KAMU-FM. 
You can find all of our shows anytime at kamu.tamu.edu. The Heart of Art is brought to you by the Academy for the Visual and Performing Arts at Texas A&M University, bringing innovative and culturally diverse visual and performing arts programming to Texas A&M University and the Brazos Valley. The Academy for the Visual and Performing Arts fosters the creativity of our community via the transformative power of the arts. The Heart of Art is sponsored in part by the Texas A&M University Art Galleries, which includes the Stark and Forsyth Galleries located inside the MSC. The galleries provide a variety of opportunities to experience art exhibitions, events, and hands-on activities. More information at uart.tamu.edu.